Let's pray together as we prepare to hear God's Word. Our Father, we thank You for being a God who has spoken and spoken clearly. Uh, You not only reveal Yourself in nature and most clearly and ultimately through Your Son, but also in Your Word. So thank You for giving us this book. We pray that You would give us minds to understand Your Word rightly and a heart to receive it humbly. And we pray that your spirit would transform us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are starting a new sermon series in First Peter called Living as Exiles. So if you don't have a Bible with you, you can grab one from under chairs nearby. And First Peter is on page 1014 in those Bibles. And if you don't uh, own a Bible, we would love for you to have one. So please take the one that you find um, under a chair nearby. Uh, This letter of 1 Peter helps Christians cultivate hope in a hostile world. Now, we live in a, what's called a post-Christian culture. The Christian faith has moved in the West from being mainly at the center to mainly at the margins. Fewer and fewer people claim to be Christians. Fewer and fewer people are part of a church. Even 15 years ago, Newsweek magazine's Easter edition was titled, The Decline and Fall of Christian America. And this decline has brought with it a shift in how Jesus and Christians are viewed by most people. One author described how the culture has shifted, and he talks about this period of decline in America and the West as a decline in phases from positive to neutral to negative. So, in past generations, being um, a gospel-believing, evangelical Christian, one who knows and loves Jesus, uh, that was viewed positively. Christian moral norms were generally the culture's moral norms in at least some respects. Then for a couple decades, things shifted and it became net neutral to identify yourself as a Christian. Christianity is viewed as one lifestyle choice among many. But now things have declined into a negative world for Christians, and this is more evidently the case with the official elite culture. So to identify as a Christian is typically intellectually and morally suspect. It's largely a net negative in our culture to identify as a Christian. And I've seen this in my lifetime, even just with how pastors are viewed. Um, When I was very young, it was still in the tail end of it was a positive thing to be a pastor. It's like, oh, your pastor, that's a good thing. I wasn't a pastor at the time, but that was kind of the culture. And then when it moved negative, it was clear that to be a pastor meant like, you know, well, good for you. You know, <laughs> someone's got to do it. Um, and then now things have shifted very quickly to where if I'm introducing myself to someone that I don't know and they ask what I do, there's a little bit of hesitancy. It can either be like a really positive reaction to that or a very negative one, or kind of just, uh, we're going to move on in this, cult, in this conversation very quickly. In America, the negativity is not typically experienced um, at this point as direct or personal persecution, but we do sense the hostility across the culture toward Christianity. Even if people are cordial in relationships, the cultural discourse is negative. Christians who live out of faith, that's faithful to God's Word, are often viewed with suspicion. So we need guidance for how to live in a culture like this. There are a lot of hot takes on important questions right now and all sorts of people giving all sorts of guidance for how Christians are to live in this situation. Should Christians be part of a political party? Is that compromising the faith or is that an application of the faith? Or should Christians just pull out of public life altogether, just focus on your personal holiness and piety? What is Christian nationalism? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it even a thing? Should we just care about Jesus and the gospel? Or does caring about Jesus and the gospel mean we care about a lot of other things? There are a lot of debates and discussions about Christianity and culture right now. You can listen to all sorts of podcasts, read all sorts of articles, read all sorts of books, and no doubt most of you have had people recommend different podcasts, articles, and books to you. But who should we be listening to about this? Well, there are lots of self-appointed experts. There are some genuinely wise voices. 
We may have friends that we talk about these things with, and that's good. Uh, And you may love those conversations, or you may hate them. But here's my question. What if we could hear from one of the Lord Jesus' own friends about how to live in a hostile world as a Christian? What if Jesus had appointed this man, this friend of his, to carry on his message and ministry in the world? What if that man, who is a friend of Jesus, appointed by Jesus to carry his message and mission into the world, what if that man also wrote a letter to Christians who were living in a culture that was negative to the faith? And what if in that letter he gave advice for even just how to think about what it means to be a Christian in that kind of culture and how to engage with people in that kind of culture? And what if that letter was ultimately God's very word, true through and through, and his word for us even today? Wouldn't that be great? That's what we have in 1 Peter. Peter was one of Jesus' closest friends. He was the leader of the disciples, which is why whenever you see lists of the disciples, his name's first. And he wrote to Christians in a culture that viewed Christians with suspicion. And it was increasingly hostile. At the time he wrote, it was more soft persecution, but it would increasingly grow. So, we want to listen to Peter and prioritize this voice above all other voices. We want to let him give us a framework for how to live well in a hostile world. As we listen to podcasts, as we read articles, as we talk to others and so forth, our first impulse should not be, oh, I like that. Oh, this article resonates with me. Ooh, that helps me. Because on what basis are we having those reactions? Just our feelings? Kind of the sum total of previous influence we've had through thinking about things? No, as we listen, we should have scriptures like 1 Peter in mind. And we should think when we listen, okay, That sounds helpful, I think I like it, but um, what did Peter say about this issue? Did he speak to anything related to this? Or I wonder if this fits with the letter of 1 Peter. Or, okay, that's an interesting take in that article, Um, but Peter said this about the posture of Christians in the world, and that seems to contradict what I'm reading here. Maybe you've heard of books with titles like The Benedict Option. Well, we'll call this The Peter Perspective. Peter shows us how to live as God's people in a world that's growing hostile. And what we'll see is that Peter gives us a very careful and wise and multifaceted approach to how we interact with people and how we engage with culture. Now, some Christians uh, mainly just accommodate to culture. They, They move with the cultural winds. Others reject it and have a posture mainly of resistance and rejection. Others try to subvert it. Others take some approach where they try to transform culture. But Peter shows how all of those approaches actually have a place at different times. And he helps us wisely navigate life in a culture like ours at a time like this. So how does he do this? Well, he helps us embrace a new identity in Christ and helps us live out the implications of this identity. So Peter gives us a distinctly Christ-centered identity, and he gives us a distinctly Christ-centered vision for how to live in a culture like ours. So this morning, we're just going to look at the first two verses of the letter, and this brief greeting, and it's just a greeting to the letter, but it contains in seed form what the rest of the letter will develop. So this greeting shows us three realities that shape how we think about life in this world. And Peter's giving us three ways to understand then our identity and what to expect in the world living with this identity. To give them ahead of time here, he says that we are elect exiles, we are saved by the triune God, and we are under his blessing. So let's consider what this means for us. So first, if you are a Christian... 
you are an elect exile. And our church here, we are elect exiles. Okay, identity is powerful. We all live life out of some sense of our identity, even if we don't have a conscious awareness exactly on how to articulate who we think we are. But we live according to our impulses and our sense of our identity. And Peter begins his letter not by saying, I'm writing to Christians. I'm writing to believers. That would have been fine. But notice in verse 1, he writes, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion. So Peter wants these Christians, he wants us to view ourselves as elect exiles. So the first part of that identity is elect. That word means that we are chosen. Who chose us? God did. What a wonder. If you are a Christian, of course that means that you chose to trust Christ and you did it freely. But there is a deeper sense in which God chose you, and He chose you before you chose Him, and His choice of you is ultimately what led to you choosing Him. And Peter says, this reality is how you should, identi- you, you should understand your identity. You are elect. You are chosen. You are chosen not because you're better than others. You're chosen not because you have proved yourself worthy. You are simply chosen and loved by God because of his own desire. But Peter is also bringing something else to mind here. He's showing that Christians are now the true Israel, the true people of God in the world. Israel in the Old Testament had this identity marker as God's elect, God's chosen people. They were one nation chosen out of all the other nations to be God's people. And now Peter is saying that Christians are the elect people of God. And he makes this connection explicit in the middle of the letter in chapter 2, verse 9. He says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Those were all titles for Israel in the Old Testament. So how does this encourage us in a hostile world? Well, you may feel like you are increasingly on the outside in whatever social spheres you live in, maybe in the workplace culture in general. This identity says that you fundamentally are included. You are welcome. You are loved. You are chosen. You are at the center of God's heart and His plan for the world. But we're not just elect. Peter also says we are exiles. To be an exile means that you have a home, a homeland somewhere else, but you've been sent away. And now you live in another nation that's not your truest home. You are a visiting foreigner. This is a primary way that Peter wants Christians to understand who they are. In chapter 2, verse 11, he calls Christians sojourners and exiles. So what does that mean? Why would he call Christians exiles? Well, at one level, we can think of it like this. Think about just Peter's original audience here for this, his letter, he's, Peter's probably in Rome, writing from Rome, and he may be writing to Christians who used to live there, but were sent away, and now they're dispersed. So he says that they're exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Those are all modern-day Turkey. So in a sense, uh, what could be going on here is that these Christians are exiles from their home in Rome. It would be like if you all were sent away out of the Indy area around the Midwest, and I started a letter uh, to you that said, you know, to the exiles in Illinois and Ohio and Kentucky. But there's almost certainly more going on here. Peter's using this as a metaphor for a Christian's true identity in general. They are exiles in the world. We are exiles in the world in general. They're not just exiled from Rome. They're exiles wherever they live in the world, even if they returned to Rome. Here's one way we know this. Look at the end of the letter. Peter gives a final greeting in chapter 5, verse 13, and he says, She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings. So Peter, at the end of the letter here, is sending along a greeting from Babylon, implying that he's writing from Babylon. But he is most certainly writing from Rome. What is he doing? Well, almost every commentator agrees that Peter is calling Rome Babylon. Why would he do that? Because Babylon is the city, the place, 
who, that took the, uh, Israel into exile in the Old Testament. It was the land that took Israel into exile in the Old Testament. Israel was sent out of their land and taken to Babylon. It was the quintessential place of exile. Peter's saying that Rome is now Babylon. Whether in Rome or whether you're sent away somewhere else, Christians live in exile. They are sojourners and strangers in this world. So whatever culture Christians find them in, in any century, in any place, they are exiles there. Their truest home is somewhere else. Where is it? It is with Christ in heaven and the coming new creation. What does this mean for us today? We are in the same situation. Nothing has fundamentally changed with our identity. We are chosen by God and we are in exile. We are at not at home in the cultures and nations and cities and towns of this world. Every Christian will have this sense of being an elect exile develop in their own life. Do you remember when you first sensed, if you're a Christian, do you remember when you first sensed that you were an elect exile? Maybe you didn't use those, that language, but when you first sensed, okay, I belong to God. He loves me. And this is creating in me a change that's making me feel displaced in this world. I feel uprooted. I feel like I'm not at home. Um, I had this experience, this growing sense of awareness when I was a freshman in high school. So I had become a Christian just a year and a half or two earlier. And I had a very slowly growing sense of what that meant for me. Um, I didn't grow up in the church, so I didn't already kind of have the framework. So some people that grow up in the church, once the Lord gives the new heart and you're converted, you, you kind of already have the framework that all of a sudden comes alive to you. And you makes it, I was just very slowly figuring out what in the world this means to be a Christian. Uh, I knew God. I knew that He knew me and loved me. And this was having an effect on me. It was change, God was changing my values and behaviors, and I was becoming different than my friends. Now, none of my friends were Christians at the time. And this was slowly starting to create a bit of a gap or tension in my life. I was loved and chosen by God, and I was becoming different and distinct from my friends. I felt less at home with their jokes, with their priorities, with their actions. I was experiencing what it meant to be an elect exile. You have your own story. Christians will not feel totally at home in any culture. Now, this doesn't mean that some cultures can't feel more at home than others. Some cultures have been influenced by Jesus and the gospel in the way that others have not. Western culture has been radically influenced by Christian values, Jesus' values. Uh, the Christian influence that brought universal human rights and the abolition of slavery took root here. But even at the height of Christian influence, no culture will feel totally like home. Peter does not give the title elect exile to any nation but to the church. It's his people, God's people, redeemed by Jesus, who are God's chosen. So our truest home is not America or any other nation, but Christ in heaven and the new creation to come. So this identity of elect exile then guards us from a couple mistakes. On the one hand, it keeps us from totally assimilating to any culture. We're to have a proper distinction from the culture. We will be different. We are foreigners here, and this is not our home. So no political party, no country, no social group will feel totally like home. And our primary way of identifying ourselves should not be any particular earthly institution. On the other hand, this also keeps us from totally disconnecting from culture as well. We don't retreat and disengage from the culture we're in. Our true home is not here, but we still do live here. We are here with a purpose. Jesus put us here to bless and to serve and to spread the good news of Jesus. In Jeremiah 29, the prophet wrote instructions to the Jewish exiles in Babylon. And this gives us a vision for how to live as exiles here in our Babylon, wherever that may be. Here's what he said. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. So it is good 
to seek to bless the community you are a part of and the nation you're a part of. It is good to be involved in politics. It is good to serve in office. It is good to steward your vote well. It is good to protest evil. It is good to promote social good. It is especially good to give people what they most need, which is the good news of Jesus and his salvation. So this identity of elect exile makes Christians a non-anxious presence in the culture because we are both connected to the culture and disconnected from the culture. So we, are, we serve here because we are put here to love and to bless, but we are non-anxious because our identity is not wrapped up in the future of, ultimately, the future of whatever country or culture we're a part of. Our identity is found in being known and loved and chosen by God. Our home was with Him. So we can engage while remaining secure and anchored in Jesus. So, you are elect exiles. Here's the second way to understand yourself. You are saved by the triune God. In the second verse, Peter draws attention to the wonder of what it means to be saved, and he shows that our salvation has each person of the Trinity involved. Father, Son, and Spirit. Now, sometimes you may hear that the Trinity was a doctrine invented by later Christians. Uh, But there are many texts just like this one that demonstrate its reality from the earliest days. So Peter will not use the word Trinity here in verse 2, but he does speak of the reality of the Trinity. And his goal here is to encourage Christians with their identity. We are exiles here, but we are saved by the triune God. So what does this mean and how should this encourage us? Verse 2 says, we are elect exiles according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with His blood. So first he says we're chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. So the language of foreknowledge here has a rich background in the Old Testament. The Old Testament said that Israel was foreknown by God as well, but this didn't mean that God just knew the future. It didn't mean that he foreknew the people would choose him and then he chose them. No, it's a relational term. So it refers not just to knowing something ahead of time, but knowing someone personally. It refers to God foreknowing them personally. So God says to the prophet Jeremiah, for instance, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. So before Jeremiah came into creation, God says, I knew you. And in Amos 3.2, God says to Israel, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. Not meaning, you are the only nation I knew about. And then I found out later that, wow, there's so many nations around here. No, he knew them personally. And in the Hebrew mindset, to know is to have a personal relationship with someone. And to foreknow is to establish that relationship before the person's even born. It's to set his love. God sets his love on someone from eternity past. So the Father foreknew us and set his love on us. Second, the Spirit sanctifies us. Peter says we're elect exiles in the sanctification of the Spirit. Uh, We often use the word sanctification to refer to the progress we make in becoming holy or becoming like Jesus through life. Um, But here, this refers to the moment when someone becomes a Christian. To be sanctified simply means to be consecrated, to be set apart for special use. So when you become a Christian, The Holy Spirit sanctifies you. He sets you apart for special use, God's purposes. And then third, Peter shows us the role of Jesus the Son. He says we're chosen for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. This also refers to what happens when we become a Christian. Peter often refers to becoming a Christian in terms of obeying the gospel or obeying God's word. So we hear the message of Jesus And then we obey it by believing it, by trusting Jesus. And as we trust Jesus, we are sprinkled with his blood. Now, that's sacrificial imagery. Uh, In the Old Testament, animals were sacrificed, and their blood was viewed as symbolically cleansing the people. So this is because the animal was viewed as dying as a substitute for the person. So we deserve death because of our sin, and the animal dies in our place. And And this results in cleansing from sin. So that's what the cross means for Christians. We deserve God's judgment for our sins, but Jesus died in our place, and when we come to him by faith, we're sprinkled with his blood. 
This combination here of obedience to Jesus and being sprinkled by his blood is interesting. There's one place in the Old Testament where these two come together. It's the central event in the Old Testament for Israel. It's when they came together and entered into a covenant with God at Mount Sinai. At the foot of the mountain, all of Israel gathered, and they professed their obedience to God, and then an animal was slain, and they were sprinkled with blood. It's it's like a marriage covenant of sorts between Israel and God. They are pledging their allegiance to Him, and they are also being cleansed uh, there and bound with the Lord and forgiven. So that's how things started for Israel. It didn't end up going well for them. They were not faithful to God, and they needed a greater sacrifice. And so the prophet said that God would bring a final sacrifice to bring an ultimate sprinkling and cleansing, and he would give new hearts to make good on our resolve to obey God. And Peter is saying now that this reality has arrived. Jesus is our sacrifice, and we receive forgiveness through him, and he brings us to the obedience of faith. So how, here's how this should encourage us today. As you live as an elect exile in the culture, you don't just get a vague sense of having a Christian identity. Becoming a Christian doesn't mean you have a bland commitment to a set of principles. You don't just get a moral code that makes you different either. You don't just have a set of beliefs that you assent to. You have a triune God of love who has welcomed you into his eternal fellowship of love God is Father, Son, and Spirit, triune God, the very source of life and love. The Father has set His heart on you and chosen you. The Son has sprinkled you with His blood, and the Spirit has set you apart for God's purposes. Your home is with the God who made you and loves you. Here's the third reality that shapes our identity in the world. You are under his blessing, and you can never get out of it. And why would you want to? What can you expect as an exile in this world? Well, you can expect hardship, you can expect rejection, you can expect frustration, you can expect a sense of displacement here. But what else can you expect now that you are saved by the triune God? Well, you can expect God to give you endless grace and peace. Peter says in verse 2, May grace and peace be multiplied to you. So this kind of statement is called a benediction. Benedictions are expected blessings. So with benedictions, we are looking to God and expecting Him to give us what only He can give. This is why we begin benedictions with the word may. We say, now may God do this for you. It's not just, um, as some call it, like a wish prayer or something like this. It's not just a, a wish or a mere uncertain hope. This is an expectation. In ben- with benedictions in the Bible, the authors are taking God's promises and casting them out ahead of us as expected blessings that we then get to receive as we walk in life. And so they're not just general wishes, they're confident expectations. And so when Peter says, may God give you grace and peace, and may he multiply those to you, he expects that to happen. He's leading us to live under God's expected blessings of grace and peace. And that's why we end our services with benedictions. It's why we often put out our hands because it's a posture of receiving, an expectation of receiving God's blessing in life. So what's this blessing in particular? What can you and I expect as we live in this world? We can expect grace and peace to be multiplied to us. If you are a Christian, you have received grace You've been chosen by grace, you've been forgiven by grace, you've been adopted into God's family by grace, you have every good gift from God's grace, you are transformed by God's grace, and Peter says, there is more grace. It will be multiplied to you because God is an endless source of grace and he's the giver of all grace. And if you're a Christian, you have received peace. You've received peace with God, you've received peace with one another. God's removed the hostility. He's calmed your souls, but there is more peace to come. It will be multiplied to you because God is the source of all peace, and He's the giver of peace. He has an endless supply. Now, you may not be a Christian yet. You've come here with a family member or a friend. 
you're exploring who Jesus is, if that's you, this is the heart of what it means to be a Christian. It means coming to this God, not just a general vague sense of God, but the one God who is Father, Son, and Spirit, and it's coming to Him to receive peace and to receive grace. Jesus came to bring grace and peace. He died for your sins so you could be forgiven by grace. He rose again so that you can have peace with God. So today you can acknowledge your need for this grace and peace. You can receive this grace and peace. If this is somewhat new to you or you want to explore more, I encourage you just to read through the letter of 1 Peter today and just look for how is it that God gives grace and peace to people and how might he give it to me? Um, Ask a Christian friend to explain how knowing Jesus and what, what Jesus did on the cross and his resurrection, how does that bring grace and peace to us and how can I get in on this? A Christian friend would love to talk to you about that. And we welcome you to join us as elect exiles in this world. And for all of us, we live, as we live as elect exiles here, we'll experience various forms of suffering. You'll experience various forms of persecution. You'll experience marginalization. You may be viewed as backwards or a bigot or as someone who hates others, even though you don't. You may have condemnation multiplied to you from others. You may have hostility multiplied to you from others. But from God, you have grace and peace multiplied. So these two verses are a dense introduction to the heart of the letter. This is for all who feel marginalized. It's all who feel outside. For all who feel socially or politically homeless. For all who feel forgotten or powerless. Peter says, yes, this world is not your home. You are an exile here, but you are an elect exile, and you are saved by the Father, Son, and Spirit, and you live under His blessing. And what you can expect is as you go into this world as an elect exile, you have grace and you have peace multiplied to you from an endless supply. So don't lose heart. Let this give you courage and love to serve and bless. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for making us elect exiles. We thank you for clarifying for us that this is our identity so that we can understand why we feel the way we do in the world and and understand how you expect us and will empower us to live in this world. And so we pray that these ways of understanding ourselves as elect exiles, as saved by the triune God, as under your blessing of grace and peace, we pray that these identities would be rooted deeply in us, that we would see all of life through the lens of these identities, and that you would give us a sense of calm and a non-anxious kind presence to others we engage with and to the culture. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.